Chapter 38, Dolly and a Real Gentleman. The winter came in early and with a great deal of cold and wet. There was snow or sleet or rain almost every day for weeks, changing only for keen driving winds or sharp frosts. The horses all felt it very much. When it is a dry cold, a couple of good thick rugs will keep the warmth in us, but when it is soaking rain, we soon get wet through and are no good. Some of the drivers had a waterproof cover to throw over, which was a fine thing, but some of the men were so poor that they could not protect either themselves or their horses, and many of them suffered very much that winter. When we horses had worked half the day, we went to our dry stables and could rest, whilst they had to sit on their boxes, sometimes staying out as late as one or two o'clock in the morning, if they had a party to wait for. When the streets were slippery with frost or snow, that was the worst of all for us horses. One mile of such traveling with a weight to draw and no firm footing would take more out of us than four on a good road. Every nerve and muscle of our bodies is on the strain to keep our balance, and added to this the fear of falling is more exhausting than anything else. If the roads are very bad indeed, our shoes are roughed, but that makes us feel nervous at first. When the weather was very bad, many of the men would go and sit in the tavern close by and get someone to watch for them. But they often lost a fare in that way and could not, as Jerry said, be there without spending money. He never went to the rising sun. There was a coffee shop near where he now and then went, or he went and bought of an old man who came to our rank with tins of hot coffee and pies. It was his opinion that spirits and beer made a man colder afterwards and that dry clothes, good food, cheerfulness, and a comfortable wife at home were the best things to keep a cabman warm. Polly always supplied him with something to eat when he could not get home, and sometimes he would see little Dolly peeping from the corner of the street to make sure if father was on the stand. If she saw him, she would run off at full speed and soon come back with something in a tin or basket, some hot soup or pudding that Polly had ready. It was wonderful how such a a little thing could get safely across the street, often thronged with horses and carriages, but she was a brave little maid and felt it quite an honor to bring father's first course, as he used to call it. She was a general favorite on the stand, and there was not a man who would not have seen her safely across the street if Jerry had not been able to do it. One cold, windy day, Dolly had brought Jerry a basin of something hot and was standing by him whilst he ate. He had scarcely begun when a gentleman, walking towards us very fast, held up his umbrella. Jerry touched his hat in return and gave the basin to Dolly, and was taking off my cloth when the gentleman, hastening up, cried out, No, no, finish your soup, my friend. I have not much time to spare, but I can wait till you have done, and set your little girl safe on the pavement. So saying, he seated himself in the cab. Jerry thanked him kindly and came back to Dolly. There, Dolly, that's a gentleman. That's a real gentleman, Dolly. He has got time and thought for the comfort of a poor cabman and a little girl. Jerry finished his soup, set the child across, and then took his orders to drive to Clapham Rise. Several times after that, the same gentleman took our cab. I think he was very fond of dogs and horses, for whenever we took him to his own door, two or three dogs would come bounding out to meet him. Sometimes he came round and patted me, saying in his quiet, pleasant way. This horse has got a good master, and he deserves it. It was a very rare thing for anyone to notice a horse that had been working for him. I have known ladies do it now and then, and this gentleman and one or two others have given me a pat and a kind word, but 99 out of 100 would as soon think of patting the steam engine that drew the train. This gentleman was not young, and there was a forward stoop in his shoulders as if he was always going at something. His lips were thin and close shut, though they had a very pleasant smile. His eye was keen, and there was something in his jaw and the motion of his head that made one think he was very determined in anything he said about. His voice was pleasant and kind. Any horse would trust that voice, though it was just as decided as everything else about him. One day, he and another gentleman took our cab. They stopped at a shop in R Street, and whilst his friend went in, he stood at the door. A little ahead of us, on the other side of the street, a cart with two very fine horses was standing before some wine vaults. 
The car carter was not with them, and I cannot tell how long they had been standing, but they seemed to think that they had waited long enough and began to move off. Before they had gone many paces, the carter came running out and caught them. He seemed furious at their having moved, and with whip and rein punished them brutally, even beating them about the head. Our gentleman saw it all and stepped very quickly across the street and said in a de decided voice, If you don't stop that directly, I'll have you summoned for leaving your horses and for brutal conduct. The man, who had clearly been drinking, poured forth some abusive language, but he left off knocking the horses about and taking the reins got into his cart. Meantime, our friend had quietly taken a notebook from his pocket and looking at the name, an address painted on the cart he wrote something down what do you want with that growled the carter as he cracked his whip and was moving on a nod and a grim smile was the only answer he got on returning to the cab our friend was joined by his companion who said laughingly i should have thought right you had enough business of your own to look after without troubling yourself about other people's horses and servants our friend stood still for a moment and throwing his head a little back. Do you know why this world is as bad as it is? No, said the other. Then I'll tell you. It is because people think only about their own business and won't trouble themselves to stand up for the oppressed, nor bring the wrongdoer to light. I never see a wicked thing like this without doing what I can, and many a master has thanked me for letting him know how his horses have been used. I wish there were more gentlemen like you, sir, said Jerry, for they are wanted badly enough in the city. After this, we continued our journey, and as they got out of the cab, our friend was saying, My doctrine is this, that if we see cruelty or wrong, that we have the power to stop and do nothing, we make ourselves sharers in the guilt 